We all agree that we live in a world that's filled with injustice. Read any newspaper or internet blog and you'll hear story after story. Young teenage girls being trafficked sexually. Children being forced to work in sweat houses. We read of senior abuse. We read of embezzlement of funds. We read of insurance companies denying legitimate claims for care. The list of unfairness and the things that are unfair in life just goes on and on and on and on. And for most part in our lives here in America, we thank the Lord that he has kept injustice from us. But when you go through it, when someone has sinned against you, done something that's unfair, the reaction mentally, emotionally, physically is intense, even spiritually. When injustice occurs against us, we all have a tendency to say, God, why'd you let this happen? And why don't you stop it? And why don't you do something about it? Because people seem like they're getting away with murder. Can you relate at all? Well, if you can, and if you have suffered some kind of an injustice in your life where someone has sinned against you, and you wonder if God is ever going to address it, our text of study this morning is going to tell you he will with a resounding yes. Let's take a look at it together. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do open, please, Esther chapter 7, as we continue our series called God's Game Plan discovering together this morning about how that plan works while we're waiting for justice. Esther chapter 7. Since it's been a few weeks since we've been in this study, let me remind you of the historic context. This book in our Old Testament revolves around a a series of events that occur in the 4th century B.C., the late 400s B.C., It occurs when King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes, as his name is translated in the New International Bible, when he rules over Persia, the most powerful kingdom on the face of the earth. The specific story in Esther is about how a wicked man by the name of Haman, he's the Persian prime minister, he develops a diabolical plan to exterminate the Jewish race from the Persian Empire. So what we've been studying is the story of an ancient Adolf Hitler and the feud between Haman's people, the Amalekites, and God's chosen people, the Jews, goes back centuries. Now, to thwart the plot, God raises up two Hebrews, a girl by the name of Esther, whom he elevates to the position of queen, and her cousin, a man named Mordecai, who's given a very, very important political position where he can discover and then expose an assassination plot against King Ahasuerus. And as we've gone through the story, we've been emphasizing the theological truth that God is much like a divine chess master. He's a hundred steps ahead of every decision and every circumstance that's made. So much so that his predetermined plan always is worked out in our lives and for all of humanity. We've been studying the doctrine of God's providence. You remember the definition? It's God's invisible hand in the glove of human history. Moving, orchestrating, guiding and directing so that everything turns out just as he determines. And he does so, interestingly, without ever violating his principle of human responsibility in decision-making. The last time that we were together, we were in chapter 6. Haman, this wicked prime minister, has built a 75-foot-tall pole in his backyard and he's going to impale Mordecai the Jew upon that pole. And it all stems from Mordecai's refusal to bow down in front of Haman 
when he walked by. The, the racial hatred between these two peoples is that intense. All Haman needed was the king's permission. So in chapter 6, we see Haman go to the palace early in the morning to try and get an execution order. Yet we discover God has a very different plan for Mordecai than having him impaled on that pole. God once again sovereignly and providentially moves in Mordecai's life and in the king's life as well. He can't sleep that night. And so he starts reading the congressional record of Persia with hopes that it'll cause him to fall asleep. But it, but it doesn't. He discovers in that record that Mordecai, who exposed the assassination plot, was never rewarded. So, God, so uh, 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 King Ahasuerus, he comes up with a plan. I'm going to take Mordecai the Jew, and I'm going to have him wear my clothes and have him ride my horse, and I'm going to have one of my top officials walk him through the city of Susa, the capital city, proclaiming this is what the king does for someone that he wants to honor. In other words, this is a great man. Well, Haman walks in, and guess who gets the job? He's going to have to lead the man that he hates through the city saying, this is a great man. After that occurs, Haman, humiliated, heads back home, and he, he gets an earful of bad news from his friends and family members. And if he thought that things couldn't get any worse, look at chapter 6 and verse 14. This will set our context and then launch us into our study. While they were still talking with him, that refers to Haman's family and friends, the king's eunuchs arrived and hastily brought Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. So remember, uh, Esther had promised to reveal to the, to the king her request at the second banquet. So this whole plot to kill all the Jews is about to get confronted. Now, with that as the background, let's dig into the details of chapter 7. We notice Esther's request is presented, verse 1. Now the king and Haman came to drink wine with Esther the queen, and the king said to Esther on the second day also, as they drank their wine at the banquet, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom it shall be done. Now remember, in the historic context, Esther has not revealed to her husband the king her ethnicity. He has no idea that she's a Jewess. But God gave this game plan to Esther, she courageously speaks up. Verse 3, Esther replied, If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me as my petition and my people as my request. I've got two things I want to ask you for. First, please spare my life and spare the lives of all of my race. Now, what race is she? Verse 4. She adds, For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed or slaughtered, and to be annihilated. Esther uses the very words of the legal document that had been passed that authorized the killing of all the Jews in the Persian Empire. And by doing such, she was revealing to her husband and to Haman, who was at the banquet with him, I'm a Jewess. And my question, my request, please spare my life and spare the lives of all of my fellow Jews. Verse 4. Now, if we had only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would have remained silent for the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance to the king. In other words, if this was just about a social or economic change of status for the Jewish people, I wouldn't even have brought it up. That's too trivial to justify disturbing the king. But this is about the annihilation of a people. And Esther essentially says, I can't stay quiet when that kind of genocide is planned. I had to speak up. Now, her husband, King Ahasuerus, 
he plays the confused husband role here. Verse 5. Who is he and where is he who would presume or dare to do thus? Who's responsible for this? The king screams. Now, who was responsible? He was. You remember back? Haman had promised to give him $170 million into his bank account to finance the killing of all the Jews. They, they, had, they had sold. They had sold the Jews for 10,000 talents of silver. Who did this? Now, he, they, the question is an answer because that's not the focus of the, of, of the story. Uh, the king asks, who would dare do this? And Esther just points her finger at Haman. Verse 6, Esther said, A foe and an enemy is this wicked Haman, the adversary of your wife and the adversary of all the Jews in the Persian Empire is your most trusted associate. Now, Haman, he's at the lunch table with them. And my guess is he choked on his prime rib sandwich right at that moment. I don't know what you would have done. It just turned white as a sheet in typical understatement, verse 6. Then Haman became terrified before the king and queen. And as where as he reacts, verse 7. Then the king arose in his anger. He, he got up in a rage, as the NIV, from drinking wine and went into the palace garden. So he gets up and he leaves. Now, why would he leave? We don't know. We don't know if he's just going out to try and get his wits about him. Man, that was a bad decision. How am I going to get out of this one? He obviously had no idea that his wife was a, was a Jewess. And because of the law that he passed, she's going to die now. And we don't know if he's thinking that through. Nor do we think it could be there going, oh, am I going to kill Esther or am I going to kill Haman? Esther, Haman. We just don't know. All we know is that God sovereignly and providentially uses that trip out to the garden to seal Haman's fate. Verse 7. As king goes out, Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw or realized that harm had been determined against him by the king. So his only hope of survival is if Esther intercedes for him. But God had an entirely different plan. Verse 8. Now when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where they were drinking wine, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. So apparently, as soon as the king goes out, Haman starts groveling before the couch that Esther was laying upon while she was eating her meal. And as he's down there at her, at her feet, the king just happens to walk in at that very moment, and he assumes the worst. Verse 8, the king said, Will he even assault or molest or force the queen with me in the house? So he's a right. You're going to sexually assault my wife while I'm standing right here? He's like, right. Thus, verse 8, as the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. So he's doomed to die at that very moment. The sentence just hasn't been pronounced yet. And at that, uh, one of the king's servants speaks up on what to do. Verse 9, then Harbana, one of the eunuchs who were before the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. So he says, hey, listen, this guy, he not only attacked your wife sexually, he also planned to kill your friend Mordecai on a 75-foot pole. He's not only against you, he's against your wife, and he's against all your friends. And with that, verse 9, the king said, hang him on it. He's judge and jury, Remember? Sentence of death pronounced, immediately carried out, verse 10. So they hanged Haman on, on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. Nothing like a quick hanging to settle a man down. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, why are these details in our Bibles? 
What's the lesson God wants you and me and us to learn? Same lesson we've learned in the first six chapters. God wants you, me, and us to know that he's calling the shots. He's moving sovereignly in the circumstances and and events of life to accomplish exactly what he wants to accomplish. So, beloved, no matter what you face today or this week, be it good, bad, or ugly, know this, God's hand is on it. And because of that, because of that, we can emphasize this main lesson from our study this morning. As we approach this next week, we can be absolutely certain that the principle of consequences from decision-making is unavoidable. You can say it a number of different ways. What goes around comes around. You can even use the farming principle. The chickens always come home to roost. The decisions that that we make have consequences that are absolutely unavoidable. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 6 said it most clearly. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also, what? Reap. There's the principle. Consequences for decision-making is absolutely unavoidable. Therefore, if I or you or we this week sow to our own flesh, if we make decisions based solely upon what's best for us, if we're selfish, self-centered, if we don't care what God's Word says, we're just doing our own thing, and we sow to that selfishness, we will from the flesh reap corruption decay, degeneration. It will not build us up, it will tear us down. That consequence is unavoidable. Conversely, if I and you and we together make good and godly decisions based upon the Holy Spirit, Paul says, if we sow to that Spirit, we will, from the Holy Spirit, reap the consequences of God's kind of life, both now and for all eternity. And so the decision is up to us. Did you come to hear from the Lord this morning? Yeah, consequences for decision-making are unavoidable. And therefore, we need to make good decisions this week. But I want to take this principle and apply it into the area of injustice that has been committed against us. Take whatever your circumstance or situation. You come up with an idea at work, somebody steals it, claims it as her or his own, makes a gazillion dollars. You study hard on a test, everybody else cheats and gets a better grade than you do. Someone comes and seduces your spouse, blows up your family. You go to court and an ex-spouse refuses to pay alimony or child support, fights you at every turn. You, You name the situation because they're all over the map for us here. And sometimes we wonder, God, why don't you do something about this? Well, the details of Haman's hanging in chapter 7 assure you and me that no one is going to get away with anything. The consequences for decision-making are unavoidable. And so we ask, Pastor, how can we be sure? Well, from this text, we can be sure because first, God's sovereignty has no loopholes. You think back in this story, God's in control of the king and the queen and their divorce. He doesn't cause it, 
but he controls it. He's in control of Esther's choice as the new queen. He's in control of the Greeks defeating the Persians in military battle. He's in control of Haman being elevated, of the assassination plot and Mordecai exposing it. He's in charge of a 75-foot gallows that's being built in the backyard. He's a hundred steps ahead. And there are no loopholes. And the scriptures simply repeat it time and again. We've highlighted Psalm 103, 19 numerous times. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over some, a few things. He, he rules over all. You know that God's in charge of your boss? You understand that? He's in charge of your health, your retirement funds, He's in charge of the presidential primaries. Somebody say praise the Lord, will you? <laughs> He's in charge of the nomination for the Supreme Court. There's nothing that God is not in charge of. He doesn't cause everything, but He's in control of everything. And therefore, if someone hurts you, and it appears they've gotten away with it, they're not going to get away with anything. Anything. Because God's purposes are always fulfilled. Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. God's got it. Therefore, we just have to wait for the Lord. And sometimes that's hard to do when an injustice has been perpetrated against you. But he assures us, nobody's going to get away with anything because his calendar has no time stamps. If I were to open my Outlook calendar on my phone, I would see that every day is divided by hours, the days, the weeks, the months, the years. And that's the way that we work. If you were to open God's Outlook calendar, it would all be blank. Because it has no time stamps. That's what theologians call the doctrine of God's transcendence. It means he doesn't work according to the ticking of our clocks. He doesn't work according to the turning of our calendars. With him there is no night, neither is there any day. There is no past, no present, no future. We, on the other hand, are limited in all of our perceptions by time and space. And oftentimes, those two perceptions collide. And we think, God, why don't you do something? Why are you waiting so long? It's because God's perception of time is completely different than ours. Remember how it says in the epistle of James? To God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like what? One day. He just works in an entirely different time frame. And what happens with people is because God's justice isn't immediately carried out, some people think, well, God doesn't know about it, or God doesn't care about what I do, or God's powerless to intervene. And thus we get Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. They just jump whole hog in because they think there's no justice with God. And when we experience an injustice, we wonder, what, what's going on? Oh, we, we have a, a family in our church. Their cousins, with whom they were very close, the dad murdered his entire family, all the children, lit the home and their bodies on fire to cover their tracks, and left, has never been caught. Where's the justice in that? Well, the answer is, there isn't any. Yet. 
And the point that we see in this story of Haman's hanging is that a delay in justice doesn't mean a denial of justice. Just because it doesn't come rapidly doesn't mean it won't come at all. Someday it will. Our perception of time simply needs to coincide with God's perception of time. And thus Philip Yancey very insightfully wrote, not until history has run its course will we understand how all things work together for good. Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. We're not going to see it all until we get out there and we look back and we're going to go, oh, that's what God was doing. Oh, I see it now. Hmm. So are you waiting for justice? Hang on. It'll come. There's no loopholes. There's just no time stamps. We can be sure because God's viewpoint has no blind spots. We've all been driving down the freeway. We want to change lanes, put on our blinker. We look in our side mirror. Nobody's in our side mirror. We start to pull over until a frantic honking of the horn. What happened? That car was in our mirror's, what? Blind spot. God has no blind spots in his mirror. Understand that? He sees everything. Everything. And there are times when injustice occurs and we think, God, you you didn't see that, did you? Because you're not doing anything about it. And this is where the psalmist, he puts all of these emotions, all of these emotions into words. Psalm 94. How long shall the wicked exult? How long are they going to get away with this? They pour forth words. They speak arrogantly. All who do wickedness vaunt themselves. They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow, the stranger, and murder the orphans. They have said, the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob pay heed. I got away with murder. And it seems like that sometimes. Well, the psalmist goes on and assures us, Pay heed, you senseless among the people. And when will you understand, stupid ones? He who planted the ear, does he not hear? He who formed the eye, does he not see? He who chastens the nations, will he not rebuke even he who teaches man knowledge? In other words, Do you think the God who created the ear somehow is deaf? You think that the God who created the eyeball somehow is blind? He sees everything. Everything. And sometimes, as God orchestrates this plan, justice comes immediately. Hang him! More often than not, though, God doesn't intervene immediately. Instead, he lets the principle of consequences run its course. That's how justice comes. Thus, the writer to the Proverbs, the waywardness of the naive will, what? Will kill him. The complacency of fools will, what? Destroy. If I'm foolish this week, if I'm complacent, if you, if we, make bad decisions this week, the consequences are unavoidable. They're, they're going to come down on us. It's not going to build us up. It's going to tear us down. But he who listens to me, wisdom says, shall live securely and be at ease from the dread of evil. If I, you, and we make good decisions based upon the principles of God's book, his promise, those consequences will show up. God won't be mocked. This is his principle. And he says, I got you. And I'll take care of it. 
My sovereignty has no loopholes. My calendar has no timetable. My viewpoint has no blind spots. Justice will come because God's faithfulness has no slip-ups. If you remember back to one of the first studies that we had in this wonderful book, we learned why there was such a hatred racially between the Amalekites and the Jews. It all goes back some a thousand years before Esther's story. When the Hebrew people were released from their slavery in Egypt, they traveled on foot across the Sinai to the Promised Land. Conservative guesstimates, two million of them. That was a huge caravan. And we're told that the weak, the sick, the elderly, all were stragglers at the end of the caravan. Would have stretched for hundreds of miles. The Amalekites came and attacked the back of the caravan. They killed the weak. They killed the lame. They killed the sick. They killed the widows. They killed the orphans, the elderly. And God hated it. And because they showed no fear of the Lord, and because God has a special place in his heart for widows and orphans, he says, I will blot out the name of Amalek from this earth. Exodus chapter 17, I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar. He named it, the Lord is my banner. And he said, the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation until they are blotted out. I would simply tell you, Haman is the last name Amalekite in the Bible. What's the point? It took a thousand years. But God was faithful to his word. He always is faithful. Thus, the challenge to you and to me today and this week, it's really straightforward. Live with an understanding of the principle The consequences for decision-making are unavoidable. And today, make the next right choice. You won't know what God's game plan is for you long down the road. He typically doesn't reveal that. And so all that you and I can do is today make a good decision to do what's right this afternoon in His eyes with how we act and how we speak and what we do and where we go, the things we say, the attitudes we take. Just make the next right decision. And if you and I and we make enough right decisions one after the other, we'll have a really right day. And we put enough right days together, we're going to have a really right week. And we put enough right weeks together, we're going to have a right month. And we can be sure that this is what God is going to do because he's made a promise to us. That if we sow from the Spirit, from the Spirit, we will reap eternal life. Now you may say, Pastor, I made some bad choices. Can I get out of the consequences? Well, I can't tell you exactly what God will do in every circumstance and situation. All I know is this, that a lot of people, they make bad decisions, to use a farming analogy. They sow wild oats six days a week, and they come to church on Sunday, the seventh day, and pray for a crop failure. Well, it doesn't always work that way. Consequences come. The good news to you and to me is that there is a power greater than the principle of consequences, and that's called the principle of grace. What God says to you and to me is not, 
I will eliminate the consequences. We all, you make a bad decision, you're going to have a bad consequence. The promise that God has made to his children is simply this. I will use that bad consequence for good. I will take even the worst decision that you have made and orchestrate it so it will accomplish something constructive and positive in your life. This is why we can say with confidence, my, your, our bad decisions do not define us as people. They impact us as people, but they don't define us. We are children of God, and He orchestrates our lives to bring about something good. He makes no such promise to anyone not His child. And we see this in the communion table. We know the principles of God's Word are unavoidable. The penalty of sin is what? Death. That consequence is unavoidable. But a more powerful principle came in of grace. And so Jesus, he pays the consequence in our place so that we could be set free from it. And in that way, God the Father is both a just God. The penalty of sin is death. Somebody's going to die. And at the same time, he can also be the justifier of those who believe in his son. We're set free not because the consequences were somehow eliminated. It's because the consequences were paid by somebody else. And we'll be reminded of that as we partake of this bread and this juice. Justice was carried out so that you and I might receive the good, being called children of God. With that stated, let me invite you to put your things away. If the ushers would join me down front. Dave, if you and the worship team would come on up, let's prepare for our time of communion together. I've asked Josh Rose, pastor of our high school ministries, to join me in serving communion. Thank you, Josh. If you know and love the Lord, this table is for you. You'll find in these trays a piece of bread and a cup of juice. Our tradition here is take them both, hang on to them. We like to take them together as a statement of our unity. Uh, we are to use this time wisely and appropriately, so be honest. Give thanks to the Lord where you have followed him. Be honest and truthful, confess it of sin where you've rebelled against him. Just be honest. If you're not yet a believer in Christ, the invitation is extended to you. The Bible says it real simply, a lot of different ways. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Turn from your sin, it's killing you. It'll separate you from God for all eternity. Jesus paid your penalty for you as your substitute so that you might be set free. The Bible says again, simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but instead have everlasting life. The invitation is extended to you. Put your trust in him, repent of your sin. If you're not yet convinced, just pass these elements by, but if you know and love the Lord, Come and join us.